You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 55. Well, welcome back, Curd Nerds. I'm Gavin Webber, and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home, among other things. Well, this week we've got uh, three email questions that I've ripped from Ask the Cheese Maker. I think it's episode number four. And I will also be playing some voicemail questions at the end of the episode. So here are the email questions. Well, g'day, curd nerds. Welcome to another episode of Ask the Cheesemaker. Now, during this episode, before I start, though, uh, I've made a couple of cheeses lately that uh, you'll see videos of in up-and-coming weeks. Um, The first one is Squeaky Cheese Curd, uh, which mm, absolutely tastes delicious. Mm. And it's a key ingredient in... um, a Canadian dish called poutine, but you'll see all that in the video. The next one is a soft cheese called asadero. It's a Mexican cheese, very much like a traditional mozzarella, but it's a lot softer, um, and that is a delicious cheese as well. Mm. Very nice. Uh, make sure you check out um, upcoming videos and subscribe to the channel. Uh, and then click the little bell next to the subscribe button um, so you can get notified of each video as it gets published. Anyway, on with the question, shall we? So this week I've actually got three questions because they're uh, a little bit shorter, but we'll see how we go. First question is from Randy Nixon. Randy asks, and I think he's from Canada, how much cheddar do you get from 10 litres of milk and how much ricotta from the resulting whey? I'm exploring the economy of making my own cheese before I plunge headlong into it. Any scale and charts would be helpful. Well, I don't need to be that technical, I don't think, uh, Randy. From 10 litres of milk, uh, when making a chatter, you'll get about a 10 to 15, it depends on how much, uh, how good the milk is, but a 10 to 15% yield from the total amount of milk. So 10 litres of milk could make between 1 and maybe 1.5 kilograms, uh, which is, what, 2 to 3 pounds of cheese. Now, how much ricotta? Really depends on how well your curd's set and how much uh, leftover protein is in the whey. Usually, when I use about 6 litres of whey, I find that I end up getting about 250 grams, maybe a little bit less, of ricotta. However, what you can do is you can add in a litre of normal uh, whole milk or full cream milk, uh, and that'll actually boost the yield of the ricotta. Uh, It's about as simple as that, Randy. Anyway, thanks very much for your question. The next question is from Carl. I'm not sure where Carl is from. Um, Carl says, hi Gavin, Uh, first of all, let me thank you for sharing your cheese making knowledge via your podcasts and videos. It's invaluable guidance, particularly for those of us just starting out. My question relates to the recipe for Parmesan. I note that you, you brine your cheese for 12 hours. Commercially produced Parmesan is placed in a brine bath for 24 days before being air dried. I readily appreciate that commercial Parmesan cheese wheels are much larger than the home-produced version, but is a 12-hour brine bath adequate? Your thoughts would be appreciated. Well, Carl, from uh, experience, yes, it is. However, there is a bit of a, um, a bit of a rule of thumb, and I'll just read that out. So when you brine your cheese, you brine it one hour per 450 grams or one pound per each inch or 2.5 centimetres of thickness of the cheese. 
Now, this is for uh, roughly for uh, cheddar, anything of that texture structure. Any close texture cheeses like Parmesan or Romano will need a little bit longer. So that 12 hours is actually uh, quite adequate. Now, from the Parmesans that I've made, I certainly have had no problems with saltiness or too much salt or too little salt. Certainly hasn't stopped the development of the cheese. And they all turn out very, very nice. So 12 hours is fine for your brine bath. Oh, thanks for your question, Carl. The next one is a little bit longer. I think there's about three questions in it. Uh, this one's from Amanda. And Amanda is from... Oh, I'll read out the question. She says all that sort of stuff. Uh, Hi, Gavin. I live in Homer, Alaska, and I have my own small farm with a dairy cow. I've left you a few voicemails already, but I have another two questions. A question or two, or three, I think. Thanks, Amanda. So, first question was, I'm wondering if I am all done pressing a cheese, if I could cut it in half before waxing as to make smaller portions. And would you do this before or after drying? Well, actually, I would not cut the cheese in half before waxing it. Uh, if, if you mean before aging it, then definitely not. The wheel of cheese needs to be intact because... Um, all the activity of the lactic bacteria uh, converting the lactose into lactic acid happens near the centre um, and the rind itself dries out from outside to in. So if you cut it in half, you're kind of stifling the activity of the cheese. So just make sure that you mature the cheese whole, so in its round form after you've pressed it, and once it's mature, then you can then cut it in half and do whatever you want with it, wax it, vac pack, and do whatever. Okay, so the next question is, uh, I use raw milk and have tried your whey ricotta twice with no avail. It doesn't coagulate for some reason. I used the whey from some prior cheese, and I made and raw whole cream. I also tried organic apple cider vinegar, and with white vinegar, and both times it wouldn't coagulate. My pigs love it when my cheeses fail. So I think the issue may be there, because you are using raw milk, you've probably used all the protein out of it, and there's hardly any left anyway. Remembering that you've got to take the ricotta right up to about 92, maybe 95 Celsius. I'm not sure what that is in Fahrenheit. I think it's about 200 Fahrenheit, roughly, um, before you add the acid in there but yeah, not sure why that's not happening for you. It could be that, like I said, when you're making your cheese, if the whey is actually yellow and clear, then you will not get a yield of ricotta from it. If it's creamy and the whey, sorry, if the whey is creamy, then yes, you will get a, a yield. I find that when I make any pasta filata cheese, very rarely do I get a, a creamy whey. It's always clear and you can't make... Uh, you can't make whey ricotta from it. Uh, last question is, uh, so far I've made, I've just made cheddar successfully. I made kefili the other day, but the curds didn't knit well because I don't think I cut them uniformly enough or small enough. Not sure. But I love your podcast and videos. I listen to you while I'm milking my cow every morning and evening, and it makes going out in the cold and dark a little bit more enjoyable. Thanks, Gavin. Well, thank you, Amanda. I really appreciate the email. So last question, I think, around kefili and it didn't knit well. You may have over cut it either too small or not small enough. So the curd size, when you cook the curd, the best way to test whether it's done, if you think you've stirred it enough, is grab a handful of curds, give it a squeeze. If it forms a ball, then and then you can press press your thumb into it and it breaks apart, then you know it's ready to press um, if you stir it enough. If you think that the cubes are too large still, then keep stirring though. They will shrink eventually. So that's a couple of ways to get around that and that simple little test of just squeezing the curd. Anyway, thanks for everybody's questions this week. Um I will be, uh, there'll be, like I said, the uh, the Asadero video will be coming out soon. 
as will the squeaky uh, cheese curd um, and uh, and a really quick overview on how to make poutine, which we had for dinner one night. It was really nice. Well, that were a pretty uh, good question. So I've got some voicemails that I'd like to answer now. So this one, first one is from Rob. Hi, Gavin. I was just wondering, can you use an aluminum pot to make the milk in, or does it have to be stainless steel? Well, thanks, Rob, for your question. I think you're from either Canada or the United States. I'm not sure. No, you cannot use aluminum or aluminium, as we say here in Australia, uh, because it is a reactive pot, and the acid that is in the milk reacts with the aluminium and imparts a metallic flavour into the milk. It doesn't taste very nice. Um, same goes for, say, cast iron. Is another reactive type of pot that you can't use. If you stick to stainless steel, and I have used glass as well in the in the past, but problem with glass is it burns the milk onto the bottom. It's pretty hard to use. But uh, stainless steel is your friend. Um, it's much easier to use a stainless steel pot. They're quite light these days, so there's no real issue with it. So. Use a non-reactive pot when you make cheese. Thanks for your question, Rob. Our next one is from Heidi. Oh, hello. My name is Heidi, and my husband and I were making the Budakesa butter cheese tonight, and we got to the stage where we cut the curd, and it oh, cut sweet. fine, and then we waited the five minutes, and then we stirred it, and it turned into complete and utter mush. It's like the curds are non-existent. And we were wondering what we could have done wrong and if there's any way we can save what we have left here. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Heidi. Um, yeah, pretty hard to diagnose that one without actually having a lot more information, but... The times that that's happened to me, it's because the milk has been um, ultra-pasteurised um, or I've used UHT milk, um, especially if you can cut the curd. Um, the uh, the structure of the proteins have been destroyed totally. Um, what you can do now to rescue that, and I know this is way in the past, but... Uh, what you can do to rescue that in future, if any of you listeners out there have the same issue, is basically uh, strain it through some tight weave cheesecloth and you will uh, let that hang for about 12 hours and uh, most of the moisture will drip out of it and you'll have a very nice cream cheese. Um, so that's how to save that sort of disaster. Alternatively, you can make ricotta of it, out of it. So use a quarter cup of white vinegar, um, heat the milk up to 92 degrees Celsius. I think that's about 195 Fahrenheit. Um, and stir it, and you should, should see it split into curds and whey, and then drain it through butter muslin again, and you'll have a lovely ricotta. Okay, now Heidi did uh, send a reply through, so I'll just play that now. Thank you so much for your reply. Um, we decided to try to save the whey and make ricotta cheese out of that and take the curd that was in there and use that as ricotta as well. It tastes delicious. It's really creamy. Um, thanks for all your videos. We really appreciate it. And Merry Christmas from Michigan. Thanks, Heidi. That's uh, pretty cool. Yes, I did have a pretty good Christmas, if anybody's asking. <laughs> I got lots and lots of uh, cheese books. Kim uh, went over the top and bought me just about every cheese-making book on the market. So I can answer everybody's questions and uh, make a swag of new cheeses in uh, 2017. We'll do one more question. And here we go. We've got one from Amanda, who we actually had an email question uh, in that Ask the Cheese Man episode. Here goes Amanda. Hi, Gavin. My name's Amanda, and I live in Homer, Alaska, USA. Uh, I just recently discovered your podcast and I actually listen to it while I'm milking my cow now. So it's really interesting. I can milk my cow and learn about making cheese. It's been really nice. Uh, I had a question about raw milk and I listened to your podcast where you interviewed 
uh, a guy talking about the differences between using raw milk and pasteurized milk. And you'd mentioned that there's some kinds of bacteria that can be unsafe when using raw milk for softer cheeses that can grow. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. And then also I was wondering, um, sometimes I have people who don't pick up their milk and I'll end up with a lot of milk in my refrigerator. And if it's begin to turn, if it's sour, is there a better cheese that I can use it for or a type of cheese that I shouldn't use it for that won't turn out as well or if it just doesn't make a difference at all. Um, And then lastly, I had a question about culturing the cream on its own just by taking the raw cream and leaving it on the counter. Um, I've read that you can do that and then you can use that cream for various things. I didn't know if you knew anything about that or had any suggestions on what else I could do with all this excess raw milk that I might end up having. Um, Again, thank you so much for your podcast. I'm really enjoying it, listening to it every morning and night in the dark with my cow. Her name is Feta. Um, All right. Well, thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing from you. Well, thanks, Amanda. Now I've got three questions to answer, but sounds like you're having fun there in Alaska and uh, milking your cow called Feta. Very aptly named. Um, Okay, so the first one, the question was around soft raw milk. um, uh, Sorry, soft cheese made from uh, raw milk. Uh, Yeah, so pasteurisation is mandatory in most countries. Um, There are quite a few... Uh, countries like France and a lot of the European countries that uh, allow raw milk cheese, but there has to be a specific process, um, you know, especially around uh, hygiene, cleanliness, sterilisation, all that sort of stuff. Some of the uh, bacteria that can infect the milk is uh, E. coli, uh, has been known to infect raw milk, so has Streptococcus, and finally tuberculosis is another bacteria that can um, be present in raw milk when it uh, starts to turn. Having said that, you mentioned about turned milk, or milk that's just starting to go sour. Best thing you could do with that is to... uh, There's two things. If you let it turn a little bit more, it turns into a thing called clabber. And uh, clabber cheese um, is... It looks kind of like yoghurt. You'll see the milk to go yogurty if you leave it overnight. Um, and then what you can do, you can strain that through a, uh, a butter muslin, tight cheesecloth, whatever you want to call it. And that becomes a cheese that you can then salt, uh, which helps protect it from some of the bacteria if you left it even longer. Uh, one of the other things you can do, you can turn it into ricotta um, nice and quick. Uh, it'd be fairly acidic anyway, but uh, just add a bit more acid. And uh, you'll get a nice ricotta and you can press that into ricotta salada. So that's a good tip for that one. And finally, cultured cream, what you can do with it. The best thing you can do with cultured cream, and anybody can do this, you can just get some fresh cream um, that doesn't have thickener in it. um, That They tend to do here in Australia, they put thickener in all the cream, uh, except when you can get it fresh. And what you can do is you can add a little bit of mesophilic culture to uh, about uh, 600 mils of cream, leave that overnight to um, acidify, and you can then just pour off uh, any whey that is there. And then all you do is put it in a jar and you shake the bejeebas out of it and it turns into butter. And then uh, to, to make the butter, you'll see the cream starts to go yellow and you basically knead the butter until the butter milk or the liquid excess whey comes out. You salt it and you have yourself some amazing um, cultured butter, just like they have in Europe. Uh, a lot of cultured butters come out of Europe and the flavour is amazing. So that's what you can do with your cultured cream. Well, hopefully I've answered all your questions, Amanda. I know you've got another one in the queue there. Um, I was looking at all the voicemails that uh, come in via littlegreencheese.com uh, and there's still a uh, fair bit of a backlog there to go, so uh, I'll have enough for a few episodes. 
Thanks again, and hope you don't get too cold in uh, Alaska. I know it's winter there, Amanda, but uh, hope Fed is doing all right. Anyway, thanks for your question. So just before I go, I'd like to call out some of my patrons um, who have pledged their support to the podcast and to the YouTube channel um, in the months of November and December. So a shout out to Cole. Thank you very much, Cole, for your pledge. A shout out to um, Craig Holbrook. Thanks very much, Craig, for your pledge as well. Uh, Kat Wilton. Thank you very much, Kat. And Ted Roberts. Thank you very much, Ted. Uh, Ted's very active on the YouTube channel. Well, thank you all of my patrons for supporting my um, efforts of making podcasts and cheese making videos on cheeseman.tv. Um, I really appreciate it. It certainly does help me um, financially to keep the uh, these going via the hosting and the equipment and all that sort of good gear that I have to purchase to um, to keep the shows going. So if you want to pledge your support, pop over to uh, littlegreencheese.com slash support. It's that easy. And uh, you'll be whisked away to the Patreon page where you can pledge your support as well. Oh, that sounds like Feta the Cow. I think uh, it's time to go. You've been listening to Little Green Cheese Podcast. For upcoming workshop dates and recipes, you can find those all over at littlegreencheese.com. You can also find my ebook, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, The Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home. And that's available in PDF format on my blog, littlegreencheese.com. You can also find all of my cheese making video tutorials on my YouTube channel, cheeseman.tv. Thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next episode of Little Green Cheese Podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music by Kevin McLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop and Call to the Dairy Cows. Bye.